Okay, we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about airfoil aerodynamics. So this is a really key aspect uh, of the fundamentals of aerospace engineering. So to get to the full level of what we can do analytically in terms of predicting aerodynamics of airfoils is going to require the development of some theory. So first, let's narrow down our focus a little bit. And what we'll focus on is incompressible flow. So this means Mach numbers less than 0 0.3. And even though most modern aircraft fly at higher Mach numbers, it's really critical to have a good grasp of the, of the low speed uh, incompressible flows before being able to tackle other regimes like transonic flow and supersonic flow. Now, a key point that needs to be made clear at the outset is that an airfoil is not the same thing as a wing. Specifically, what an airfoil is, is a 2D section of a wing in the plane of the incoming velocity. So we can draw that like this, sketch out an airfoil and a wing. So there's a wing, here's our incoming velocity, the infinity, and so an airfoil would be a section cut from that wing. The tool we're going to use to explore airfoil uh, aerodynamics is low speed airfoil theory. Okay, now what this does is uses inviscid flow theory to determine the lift and the moment on an airfoil. Now, key point is since this is an inviscid approach, it does not tell us anything about drag. Because that is for an airfoil a viscous effect. Now, we'll learn as we go through this
that the lift per unit span that's generated by an airfoil, and I remember our notation from before, that means it's going to be L prime, can be written as rho infinity, the free stream density, V infinity, the free stream velocity, times the quantity, capital gamma, called the circulation. And this circulation is determined from the application of potential flow theory. This is something that you will learn a little bit about in your third year fluids class that many of you are taking simultaneously with this course, but we'll need to go into somewhat greater depth uh, to have the tools ready at our disposal to be able to determine the lift and moment generated by an airfoil using potential flow. So let's start with some preliminary concepts that we're going to need to develop potential flow theory so that we can eventually get it predicting lift and moment on airfoils. And this comes from the textbook. Anderson sections 2.9 to 2.18. So, continuing on from some of the ideas um, that you saw in your second year fluids and calculus is the idea of the substantial derivative. This combines the time and space derivatives for a field. And so the definition is capital D by capital DT of something is partial d partial t of the something plus v, the velocity vector associated with the field, dot del of the thing that we want to take the derivative of. So to fully appreciate what this is, I think it's instructive to look at differences in the various types of time derivatives. So there's ddt, partial by partial t, and capital D, capital DT. All these have different meanings, so they're related. So, start with the traditional DDT, and this is simply the time rate of change for a fluid particle. So, if you are riding on a fluid particle as it moves around, the rate of change that you'd experience is indicated by DDT of whatever, pressure, velocity, temperature, any field. Next is partial by partial T. 
Now this is the time range change at a point in space. So this is now you're planted at some location and some fluid particles are going by. And as each particle goes by, something perhaps is going on that causes the velocity of the particle as it passes by you while you're in a fixed location to change over time. That would be a non-zero partial velocity in this case by partial t. And again, the same principle applies to other fields like pressure and temperature. Finally, there's the substantial derivative, capital D by dt, and this is the total rate of change. for a particle as it moves through space and through time. So in class, we'll spend some time doing an example that deals with these different types of time derivatives just to help make it really clear because it's very helpful to understand the differences between these uh, in, to, in order to help interpret not only solutions of flow fields, but to interpret the governing equations and be able to gain some insight into what's important in a specific flow just by looking at what terms are or aren't present. Now, somewhat related to this idea of whether we're thinking about particles or a point in space, are ways of linking these together in some sort of history. So there's three ideas that people use to do this, depending on the situation. And sometimes they're the same as we'll see, and so things are much simpler. So these three ideas are path lines, stream lines, and streak lines. So to start, I'll just simply give what each of these means. So a path line is a locus of points through which a fluid element has passed. In other words, it's the spatial history of a certain fluid particle. So if a particle started here and ended up over here, the path line tells us how it got from A to B. A streamline is a curve which is everywhere tangent to the fluid's velocity vector. So that means if there was fluid particle going from A to B along this path. You can see that here, the velocity vector points like that. Here, it points like that. Here, it points like that. And if you considered every point in between, you would get this curve, which is the streamline between A and B. And finally, the streak line
is a locus of fluid elements, which have passed through a specified point in space. Now you can see that that sort of makes it the opposite of a pass of a pass line. Now, since in this course in general we're going to be considering steady flow, the thing you need to know is that in steady flow. These are all the same. It's only in an unsteady flow that there's differences between the path line, stream line, and streak lines for a flow. In steady flow, they give exactly the same curves. next idea I want to present is the idea of angular velocity in a fluid and two complementary ideas that go along with that, vorticity and circulation. Now as we saw circulation is going to turn out to be critical to the calculation of lift over an airfoil. Point twelve to two point thirteen. So, start with the vorticity, which is a very fundamental concept. Usually, we give this to vector theta, and by definition, simply the curl of the velocity field. And it can be shown, and this will probably be discussed in your fluids class, or maybe even we talked about it last year, is that this is two times the angular velocity. Of the fluid. So The reason that people invented vorticity is that, well, one, it's what comes out when you do this cross product and take the curl of the velocity field, but really it's just for convenience because this quantity 2 times omega shows up very often. in various forms of equations. So zeta equals 2 omega is really just for convenience. Now you'll recall that last time I talked a little bit about irrotational flow when we were talking about the Bernoulli equation. Now, irrotational flow means that grad cross V or the vorticity is zero everywhere in the flow field. In many real flows, The flow outside of the boundary layer, which I'll abbreviate BL, has zero vorticity and is therefore irrotational. So this is a very powerful fact that we're going to be able to use to our great advantage when we're analyzing the flow 
around airflow. Now the last of these three linked concepts is circulation. And this, as I mentioned, is fundamental to the calculation of lift. So the easiest way to explain circulation is probably to start with a picture. So let's just say we have some kind of flow field with one streamline that looks like that, perhaps another streamline over here that looks like that, and yet another one down here that looks like that. And if we take some contour within this flow field, we'll call this contour C. And inside of this contour, there's some vorticity. Then if we define the velocity locally on the surface of the contour is V. And the local vector along the contour outline is dS then the circulation gamma is defined as minus and this is a aerodynamic convention that gives a clockwise positive circulation closed circular integral over the contour C a V dot product with ds. Okay. So the velocity dotted with the local little bit of contour length in vector form. You integrate that around the contour and that gives you the circulation around that contour. And this minus sign gives clockwise gamma greater than zero. Now, this, even though this definition doesn't involve the vorticity, this is very carefully or very closely related to the vorticity as follows. So, something that you may have learned in calculus class is something called Stokes theorem or sometimes there's some other names for it as well but it essentially allows you to relate a surface integral to a contour integral so we can say that if s sorry, this, would be, this is s s is the surface enclosed by C. And if we take the area integral over S of grad cross V, again, dot D big S, so times a little bit of area, then that also gives us the circulation. So this is from Stokes' theorem. Sometimes this is also called Gauss's theorem. Essentially it says that the gradient of a quantity integrated over a surface is equal to the line integral of that quantity around the contour of the surface. So just to be clear here, S is the surface enclosed by contour C. Okay. 